The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Welcome to Element 14 Presents. I'm Ben Heckendorn, former host of The Ben Heck Show. With me today is DJ Harrigan. How's it going today, DJ? Pretty good, Ben, how are you? So are you actually a DJ or does that stand for something like Dwayne Johnson? Uh, that is correct. I am, I am his sole heir. So uh, you're one of the new creators. Can you tell me what you are planning to make? Yeah, so I'm gonna be making my own do-it-yourself cell phone using the Raspberry Pi. And I'm gonna have a capacitive touchscreen, so it's gonna be a full GUI. Oh, so it'll be a high quality screen. Yeah, yeah, it'll it'll look a little nice. Not not quite as nice as modern phones, but you know, for a do-it-yourself project, I'll be happy with it, I think. Now, is it going to bend when you put it in your pocket? Uh, no, I think my pocket will probably tear right open. Uh, 2G, 3G, what are you using for a module? Uh, 2G, for sure. The 2G modules are still so cheap, and the networks are still gonna be around for a couple years. This sounds like a really cool project. I would highly suggest that you make sure your phone number does not appear on camera. Great advice, Ben. I definitely think I've got a lot of work ahead of me. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. cell phones are pretty nifty. They've got all kinds of advanced features like high resolution displays and processors that are just as good as personal computers were 10 years ago. But frankly, they're not accessible. There are no full-size USB ports or GPIO pins. Now I know that's not really a mass market thing, but I want my cell phone to have that. And while I could expand it with dongles, I'm not gonna do that. Instead, of making a bad product less worse, I'm gonna make a good product from scratch, or at least a prototype of one. And I'm gonna do it all with a Raspberry Pi. But wait, the Raspberry Pi doesn't have a cellular connection, you proclaim. And you're right. At least the Pi 3 B Plus only has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. We're not gonna do anything like voice over IP. So if we want an actual cellular connection, it turns out that's pretty easy. There are basically modules like this, the SimCom 800L, which for all intents and purposes is a cell phone on a chip, and it makes it dead simple to get anything with a UART able to make advanced cellular connections without knowing anything about RF, which I don't know. I don't know any. So we've got the Raspberry Pi as the heart of our system, and we've got the SimCom 800 as our cellular connection. Well, what are we gonna do for an interface? Well, me personally, I've got an FTDI chip implanted in my spinal column, so it's not really much of an issue for me. But for most people, you're probably gonna want some sort of uh, touchy interface. So we could use buttons, and buttons are great. I miss tactile feel in a lot of electronics. But when you've got buttons with an interface as rich as a cell phone, you get kind of locked down. So rather than being locked down, I'm going to free myself with the power of software and touchscreens. So touchscreens that have a resistive interface are fairly common, but resistive interfaces ooh, don't feel so good anymore. They were okay in the 90s, but you know now that we've got capacitive touchscreens, it's a little hard to go back. So I'm gonna use this, this is the Hyperpixel, and it is a 800 by 480 pixel display that has a snazzy capacitive touch interface. And since it will act just like a mouse for the Raspberry Pi, it will be fairly straightforward to program whatever buttons we want, and it should look okay. So as it turns out, the Hyperpixel mates directly on to the Raspberry Pi, which is great. That makes it compact and easy to interface with, but, it turns out that it actually needs all of the GPIO for its parallel connection. So unfortunately, we no longer have access to the uh, UART that we need to talk to our cellular modem. Now, we could use a USB to serial adapter and that would totally work. But due to the portable nature of our device, I've got another solution. I'm gonna be using this, the phone of Feather. 
and the Fona Feather just so happens to have the exact same GSM modem that we need, plus it's got built-in battery charging, which is super handy and cuts down on soldering time. Now, I'm using the Pi 3B+, Plus, which is, as of right now, the latest offering from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Not only is it super fast, but uh, it's super power hungry. So in order to power our cellular connection, which is also power hungry, and the Raspberry Pi, I'm gonna be using this big beefy 2500 milliamp hour uh, single cell lithium battery. And it does have to be single cell because the GSM modem actually runs directly off of the typical range of a single cell. So anywhere from three to 4.2 volts at max charge, which is very convenient. But that also leaves us with another challenge. So while the uh, AT Mega can run off of the lower voltage, the Raspberry Pi needs five volts. So I'm gonna be using this super beefy uh, step-up converter, which can pump out up to five amps at five volts, which is more than enough for our Pi and display. So we've got one final challenge. As soon as you plug in the lithium battery to the Fona, it's on. And if we plug in the Fona to the Raspberry Pi, it'll be connected to the five volt rail. And if the five volt rail is connected to the Fona, it'll charge the battery. But the battery is powering the Raspberry Pi which means the battery would be charging itself, which, while it does sound enticing, I don't think the physics uh, works out for perpetual energy, so we're actually going to need to separate the five volt line on the USB connection from the AT Mega to the Raspberry Pi. All right, now that we know the parts that we're going to use, let's go solder them up. All right, so now I'm ready to solder. So I've got my parts that I'm actually going to connect right here laid out on a uh, project tray. It's definitely not just a scrap piece of MDF that I had laying around. Uh, and there's really not a whole lot to do. So let's just jump right into it. All right. Now that I've got everything mostly soldered, I can more easily explain how everything goes together. First up, we've got the battery. Now, the only thing I've really done to the battery is add a switch in line with the positive rail. Now, this is necessary because this will be our hard system power switch. Whenever the battery is plugged into the phone board, it will be on and powering the AT Mega and the Simcom and some little status LEDs, and of course we need to be able to turn the phone off. Now, I've just left the JST connector on there because we've got a nice little polarized uh, connection, which is great, and I've got the phone here, and what I've gone and done is added a micro USB connection, because remember, this is our power connection, this is how we're gonna charge the system, and this is the only time we've got VUSB connected to the phone board, and this will be from an external connection when we're charging it up. Because, remember, we've only got a data connection on our makeshift cable, and this will go from the phone to the Raspberry Pi. Now, I've also got a connection from the battery, so the VBAT pin, to a switch, to the boost converter. Now I've got this switch because we need to be able to turn off the five volt system. This will disconnect the uh, boost converter and the Raspberry Pi and the screen, which is totally necessary so that when the LiPo is connected, we can actually charge this thing because this consumes more current than the charger supplies to the battery. So it would never charge without that switch. The only other things I've done to the microphone and speaker are add some leads so we can solder those right up to the phona in the middle there. And then we can connect the five volt leads to some of the uh, pins on the back of the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I guess we should probably choose the power pins. All right, so in order to make a case for the electronics, I needed to 3D model everything. So here you can take a look at the models I made in Fusion 360, 
and uh, just about everything is in there. Now, I modeled most of this from scratch, but some of the more detailed parts you see, like the boost converter or the Raspberry Pi, uh, I was able to find step files for, um, which many uh, engineered components you can find 3D models for, which is really handy, saves a lot of time. Uh, the first 3D print, uh, or piece to be 3D printed, I designed was the faceplate, which just has some holes for the speaker, the screen, and the microphone, and for the screws, which will screw into the main body. So nothing is really securely mounted to the faceplate, it's just a window for all those components. Now here we can take a look at the main body. This is the largest 3D print. I split everything up so that there would be two plates that I could change and adjust if I want to uh, tweak the distance between the screen and the ports or wanted to add some holes for buttons or something in the future. That's an easier print. And the main, I guess, chassis uh, or structure um, doesn't change. It just keeps everything in place. I also added a small plate for the switches and a hole for the charging port. And underneath we've got the base plate, or back plate. And I've got some vent holes so it's not completely sealed uh, all the way through except for that gigantic hole uh, for the USB ports and for the antenna. Although I could tuck the antenna inside, uh, I did want the option for it to stick out because I'm sure it uh, has a little bit better reception in free space. Other than that, just have that nice Raspberry logo on the back and everything is just about ready to be 3D printed. It only took a few iterations. Let's get going. Now, we will need to do a few things to configure the Hyperpixel to work with our Raspberry Pi. Right now, I'm just running through the installation script, and this was provided kindly by Pimeroni. It is very straightforward to do, and uh, not terribly hard, even for a Linux newbie like me. So if you want to learn more, you can always go to their GitHub and check out the exact scripts and what other features or errors you might encounter. I did not encounter any errors. Now, we will be using this in portrait mode, so you need to edit config.txt. And I'm just going over here and changing the frame buffer to uh, be narrower at the width and longer at the height and changing the rotation and making sure of that because there are of course two vertical rotations or portrait rotations I should say. Now there is a small Arduino component to this build. I am using the Adafruit Phone of Feather uh, which is an Arduino compatible board with the GSM module already on there which means we probably need a library to get started with it and I've already got the library installed on my computer, but if you wanna go check it out, head on over to Adafruit's learning landing page. I'm literally just using the default demo sketch plus a few minor modifications to make serial communication easier, uh, but this goes into a lot more detail on how to interface with the GSM module and all of its features. All right, everything's laid out and ready to go. So, uh, let's do it a little bit faster. All right, so now I've got just about everything assembled. Now I've left off the faceplate and backplate so we can get a better look at the components. The main power switches are still right here. We've got our charging port. Right now the microphone and the speaker are free-floating, but they're not gonna go anywhere right now. We've got the USB uh, plugged in to our Raspberry Pi, and you can see the Fona 
back here, just a little bit of electrical tape to insulate it from the base of the Raspberry Pi and the antenna sticking out. We could tuck it in later, but for right now, this is uh, more guaranteed to work um, or more likely to work. I shouldn't say guaranteed. Other than that, everything is mostly securely mounted and I'm just gonna go ahead and put on the back plate for right now and then we'll turn it on and test it out. Right now I've still got it in windowed mode because sometimes it uh, loses responsiveness and I need to uh, more forcefully close it. But I can of course set it to full screen and we'll do that in a bit. Here I've got my home menu where I can go to dial, text, you can check out context or system. So if I go to dial, I get a little dial pad and I can press some numbers right here. It's my favorite, favorite phone number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Just delete them. So I'm not actually gonna call that. Go back home, go to text. Right now I'm using Pygame, which is graphical, but not the best for creating uh, a really well-structured GUI. Um, I'm definitely going to use something uh, a bit more professional like QT in the future. Um, right now, SendText isn't going to send anything because I haven't selected a contact. So let me just go back home. So if I go to contacts, uh, I've got some default ones. These are just dummy numbers. Um, of course, the third one will be me. I'm going to go down one. And we're just going to block my phone number there for a second. So I could call myself. Let's call myself. So now, oh, oh, what's that? Am I calling myself from my own phone? So now if I go to text, should, hmm? But wait. There's more. Not only can the PiPhone Plus initiate phone calls and send default text messages, it can also receive phone calls. I know, I know, it's impressive. Hmm? Well, that about does it for the Pi Phone Plus. We set out to build a do-it-yourself cell phone with the Raspberry Pi. We were able to send and receive calls, send basic text messages, and configure basic settings. Now, I'd call that a successful prototype. It definitely needs a lot more polish before it could be used as a daily cellular companion, but I'm pretty happy with how it came out. Well, that's all the time we've got for today. What do you think a DIY cell phone should have? Have you ever used a GSM module in your projects? And what features should I add to my phone? Let us know at the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash presents. We'll see you next time.